television highlights of the news of yesteryear. In 1912, and General Yui Hubert Gonzalve Leoti takes command of the French Foreign Legion in Morocco and Algeria. In his charge are 37 battalions of French and Moroccan troops, most of them mounted. But war against rebellious desert tribes demands foot soldiers too, and the French troops are augmented and supported by hundreds of native soldiers. These are loyal and hard-fighting Zouaves. And here's good look at a native Bakamar. In safety of Big City, French commander prepares for the move into enemy-ridden lands as he gives each Bakamar his orders for the march. And the convoy heads out into the open desert. Its destination, an embattled outpost in the war-torn Atlas Mountains. These are actual on-the-spot films of French Foreign Legion forces heading into hostile territory. The time, 1912. These troops will not fight the Kaiser for two more years. In enemy-infested land, the convoy pushes slowly through the roche Percée, with advance guards scouting ahead for sign of hostile tribes poised for an attack. Here are the convoy's cattle, food for the peaceful colonies encircled by warring natives. And an army of 6,000 well-equipped men guards the convoy every mile of the way. Occasionally, traveling chieftains ride out of the desert to offer convoy the services of their best horsemen. Here's dramatic look into yesterday, as French troops and tribal cavalry meet in mountains of al -Tafi. Here's action in warlike Africa, before years of war in Europe. In highlands past Fez, Taza, and Debdu, convoy is far beyond last outpost of protective civilization, and cannon are ready to lash out at the enemy. This is encampment at Beni Malhal in 1912, when native uprisings are at their most violent. To rebel leaders, French protectors are invaders and to ambush and slaughter any foreigner is the order of the day. Peaceful and progressive natives are happy to see the French, for the convoys carry their grain to Moroccan and Algerian markets. Now farming North Africans will prosper, and French Africa's starving cities will have food. This precious grain will not fall into hands of plundering desert tribes. Armed guards will see it to its destination, and native cavalrymen, paid for their valuable aid, are not likely to side with rebel chieftains who give them nothing but trouble. Some loyal natives receive the Legion's high awards, proof of performance. With danger just over the horizon, or nearer still behind the rise of desert dunes, or the fortress-like towers of Atlas Mountain Rocks, the convoy moves on. Here it is arriving at the outpost of Kazbak Teola in Atlas Mountains. Men are at battle stations at every hour of the day, and when fierce desert tribes attack, troops of the French Foreign Legion are ready for battle. Yes, this was North Africa in 1912. It's 1939, and in New York City, inventor Minotti Nanny tells audience... This is a self-launching lifeboat to save life at sea, and we are ready to test it. Come on, cutie. With two trusting sons as passengers, Senior Nanny prepares to demonstrate dependability of his darling. Sealing themselves in against the salt water of the sea, they're all set for safe sailing. And they're off and into the water with a roar and resounding splash. But something's wrong. Occupants of lifeboat look as if they're in need of a lifeboat. With craft slowly sinking, crafty inventor and sons roll out wearing inflated life preservers. 
says inventor Nanny, this is enough to get a nanny's goat. Fresh from the war-torn but now peaceful fields of France, here's war correspondent Floyd Gibbons. It's 1919, and Gibbons wears patch over eye, evidence of wound received while covering recent doings of doughboys at Chateau Thierry. He's soon to become world-famous radio reporter Floyd Gibbons. He's Mary Pickford's brother Jack. She's actress Olive Thomas. They're also Mr. and Mrs. Jack Pickford, setting sail for honeymoon in Paris. It's summer of 1920, and all's well with honeymooning Pickfords till September 10th, when Olive Pickford dies in Paris of dose of poison. Here's maestro Arturo Toscanini, way back in 1921. Fame conductor has brought Italy's La Scala Orchestra across Atlantic to tour United States and Canada. Already one of Europe's most popular conductors, this is how Toscanini looked on threshold of glory in America. This is many years before his brilliant radio broadcasts and historic performances on television. It's 15th of April, 1928, and steamer New York is stuck fast in sandbank of Cape Cod Canal. Bound from Boston to New York, liner is lashed by gale and crazy currents and steams into Sandbank under shadow of Sagamore Bridge. Coast Guard boats remove all stranded passengers with aid of tugs. All 400 seafarers are safe. Not one person is injured. An investigation reveals that even the ship is in shape. It's 1925, and at New York's famous Roseland Ballroom, here's Charleston Contest with music provided by Gene Goldcatch Orchestra. Band leader Benny Goodman, Sultan of Swing, got his start in Goldcatch Orchestra, and it looks as if dancing the Charleston is where the Hepcats of 1925 got their strange figures. If you don't think this was work, look at our dancing darling. She's danced off both her shoes, and it looks as if he's going to dance off a few pounds. It's 10th of November, 1925, and several thousand half-frozen persons brave wintry winds to witness laying of cornerstone of nave of Cathedral of St. John the Divine gigantic Protestant Episcopal Church at Amsterdam Avenue and 110th Street in New York. Governor Alfred E. Smith and his staff lead procession of dignitaries, which includes Bishop James E. Freeman of Washington and Elihu Root, chairman of Citizens Committee to complete cathedral. Among largest churches in America, Cathedral of St. John the Divine was still not finished by 1950. And this bird has wings. And sometimes it even has a propeller. Hey, fellas, your propeller fell off again. It's early 1920s, and a couple of would-be Wright brothers are all wrong as their flying machine with flapping wings goes flap, flap, flop. Fashions of the time, and the time is 1910. Here's what the well-dressed young matron wore when she went motoring in her high-class, horseless carriage of the day. And for an afternoon, she was complete with bustle. For comfort, no doubt, or maybe for ballast. Careful you don't sink the ship. That must be as seaworthy a craft as ever sailed the seven seas. Could this apparition be the model for the monster of the lost? On drier land, the well-dressed lady of 1910 looked like this at tea. 
And she's even beautiful enough to be honey to a couple of visiting bees. Sweet enough, too. It's the parson with a new member of the clergy our damsel has to meet. Bet behind her back they called her the hat. Have you ever seen a bramble bush walking? Well, now you certainly have. Yes, be thankful 1910 isn't now, but then. Big Chief and Big Train. It's 18th of June, 1925, as President Calvin Coolidge hands Walter Johnson coveted award. Johnson of Washington Senators has been chosen most valuable player in American League. Well-deserved honor for famed pitcher. From 42 to 2, it's March 1928, as horses go to the post at Aintree, England, for an annual running of the historic Grand National. 42 horses leave the starting wire to brave the 30 perilous jumps of the four and one half mile course. Spills cut the size of the pack in early stages of the race, and many a falling horse and jockey are hurt. Every leap is the last one for some entrant, and the hedge isn't all they have to hurdle. Some meet their Waterloo at edge of water hazard. one jockey they'll have to carry to the clubhouse. Near finish three horses, now two cross final hurdle, and one finisher is riderless. Winner is 100 to one shot, and his name is Tipperary Tim. 